Well, welcome everybody to the third edition of the Big on Small podcast. Good and, things coming through, Steve. Good things coming through. And uh, as normal, we have uh, a, well, in the rooms, uh, we have uh, me, myself, uh, Steve Wasmith. Um, got me, Paul Kipax. And Titanium Taco in the room. Yeah, titanium taco? Why titanium taco? Are you turned into Superman or something, uh, Taco? No, my, my topic is on sunscreen, but first let's ask Steve what he's going to do. Oh, OK. So, Steve, what have you spotted uh, um, uh, and why? Over well, the last... as a slight diversion before I get started with my topic, mm-hmm. I was most in- amused yesterday with the, the sale at £60,000 of the world's first mic- uh, micron-sized handbag, which was something like about 600 microns by 200 microns by about 700 microns mm-hmm. as a designer handbag with, with a monograph on. And it's done by an artist collective who says they made the handbag useless because it's so, so, so small that no one could put anything in it. Because, yes, you're not going to be able to put much, much uh, in there. And it's got a picture of it on the size of someone's fi- figure, uh, finger. They gave it to Pharrell Williams, who promptly sold it for £60,000. So, mm. uh, so, so I guess he's happy. So a challenge to all our listeners out there. Um, uh, we were geeky about things, and, th- and now we want to be geeky about things that you could put in a 60-micron-sized handbag. 600-micron. 600 600-micron-sized 600 handbag. So send in ideas. We'll cover them in another version of this um, uh, uh, podcast. But uh, I don't know about you, Steve. I'm feeling quite summery at the moment. Yes, so am I. And that goes into to my, to what I'm going to talk about. I'm okay. going to talk about sand. Sand. Yes. That's everyone knows about sand, surely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, since we were kids and things like that. But nobody, well, everyone thinks they know about sand. That's the thing. But (laughs) nobody really knows about sand because actually the physics of sand and how sand works is actually uh, completely unknown and actually far more makes general relativity look like something you do in primary school. According to the physicists, you know, it's an immensely complicated thing. So, wait a sec, we've all been on a beach, and I don't, I don't know about you, Taco, um, made sand castles and dams and, and things like that. Uh, That's um, what the Dutch what do. Your fa- what when your we see sand, activity? we make dams. That's the Dutch nature. Yes. So, that surely a, a kid can manage sand, sh- uh, can't science? Uh, no, but because the, the problem is it's... Uh, it's a, it's a, the really understanding how granular particles flow is just a major unresolved uh, physics problem because everything plays a part. Size plays a part. So does shape, and shape's probably the thing that gives uh, the biggest challenge. And so does composition. So what is in the sand, mm-hmm. as in so what uh, what minerals are in the sand, the shape, uh, the shape of the sand, as well as the size. The size is probably the simplest thing. It's a lot of shape. Is kind of in there and why do people want to look, understand sand what's well, important for agriculture and building and if i was going to say you uh to paul i can quote biblical quotes of paul mm-hmm. and I actually can say matthew 7 24 to 27 which is oh no don't do that. <laughs> the parallel the wise and foolish builders all oh, right so the person that built his uh his house on a rock and that and, and the foolish builder built his ha- house on sand well, I suppose a rock is a very, very large sand grain. Exactly. It? <laughs> and but if the foolish builder had built his ha- sand on uh, stuff which was fairly regularly packed and fairly dense and tight, it would have been fine. <laughs> it's just if you build it, your hand on on nice round spherical sand grains, it, it's not a very good idea because they move around a lot. But if but that's the thing. If you dig, if you're digging for a sand castle, you start off at the beginning. You've got uh, it feels soft. It's it's fairly close packed. It feels soft, uh, soft to move around. But it, as you go deeper, it gets harder. It becomes more tightly packed. And obviously, anything between six, 60 microns and two millimeters is classed as sand. But uh, if you go to a civil engineering website, I looked at it says grains should be sh- sharp, so- strong, and angular, but no further qualification. Mm-hmm. What is angular? Or what? How angular? Or uh, but some grains are spherical and not angular anyway. So round sand feels soft, loose packing. Sand on top is easy to dig, and then you get more compact as you go down. But so you're trying to understand this because obviously the stability of building, as I just said. But so predicting sand flow is complex. So what people tend to do, you do it by experiment and not theory. 
Mm-hmm. So pretty much you've, you've designed something, you put sand into it, and you adjust the design to get eventually get what you want. But I then, uh, so I was, I was going to do more detail on sand, and then I was just I thought to myself, when I was saying that everything's done by prediction, of course, sand was used in probably one of the earliest scientific instruments that we actually had, which was then done as really as a precision device. So if you think we're in the 14th, 14th century, uh, the sand glass was the principal time uh, principal timepiece that people were actually using. Mm-hmm. So so if, if sand is unpredictable in the flow and you're trying to make sand glasses and make things the same and, and have a standardized unit of time, that uh, you need it to be predictable. But if sand isn't predictable, how do you make it predictable? And the answer to that is the sand in a sand glass is not sand. Ooh. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why it's predictable. It's it's several different things because sand the flow of sand is not predictable because of the shape and the, and the composition. So the inner side of sand glass is either ballotini, which is glass spheres, or they used to use marble powder. Often they would steal marble powder from cemeteries. Ooh. So we're on things with bit, uh, big mausoleums with big marble doors, and it would grind and leave a bit of marble powder, and these people would then take it and use it for, for sand glasses. And crushed burn, uh, a mixture of lead and crushed burnt eggshells. And a lot of cookbooks of the actual time. Well, it wasn't quite so much a cookbook. It was a book of household management. And in these in these kind of like 14th, 15th century uh, books, there will often be recipes for making sand for hourglasses, yeah. which would kind of come into, uh, into, into that. So it's crushed up eggshells uh, and marble powder. And, and, and the question I have on that, uh, Steve, uh, is does it matter because the, the color of sand? I've been shocked in Hawaii on the beach. You see black sand. And that's a, is that a different sand than the white sand we see on all our beaches? Is that different shapes, forms, materials? And, and different elemental compositions. Yeah, yeah for different min- from different minerals. Because, yeah, you have pink sand. I've been on pink sand beaches, and if you go to te- if you're going on your holiday to Tenerife, it's black sand because it's volcanic. So yeah, they will. The, the, uh, so the uh, that, and that's why it's a mixture of sh- shape, sand, and composition. So sand is somewhat like more than panalytical. It's a mixture of sizing and shape and elemental composition and uh, and crystalline form. Is, is the the sand glass running slower with black sand or with with white sand? Or is uh, that a wrong question? Thanks. They, these days they tend to just dye ballotini, so glass beads. You can gla- dye the glass beads to yep. make for, for a kind of a fashion statement. And, and then you think about what's the precision of these things anyway. Normally about the biggest, largest one they made was about not really an hourglass. It was probably 90, uh, for a 19 minute, 45 second ones was plus minus five seconds, which is 0.4%, which, is, which isn't bad. But multiple sunglasses, it could be up to about one and a half percent. But still not bad oh, for the 14th for boiling eggs. Though, yeah, but and for the 14th century and uh, these kind of things. So that was kind of my diversion, starting thinking about sand and ending up wondering about the precision so, of hourglasses. So predict, uh, so um, uh, predicting the flow, predicting the packing, um, uh, the link to elemental composition, which must say how the sand erodes and things like that. And well, it is about how hard it is, which will then affect what the final particle size will be. Because even if you have the same size wave and the same uh, the same shear from the from element, uh, the what the elemental composition will then take the final particle size because they were all different. So, and what we're saying is that we need more reflection by children before they start making uh, sand castles on the beach. Isn't they? Exactly. And what was that quote you had from the civil engineers as to what sand should be? You said uh, it was something sh- uh, sharp and angular, sharp, angular, uh, and, and strong, and strong. Well, might be describing a builder. Which, well, the builders are sharp in the gun dress and strong. It might be a description of us. And in fact, sharp, <laughs> angular and strong, taco. Then where are you, what were you thinking about about your summer holidays then? Steve is building sand castles. What are you sure. doing with yourself? So I was thinking about, of course, I have a very large uh, sun collector on my head. And I was thinking <laughs> how how to protect this, this, this precious sun collector. And then you come onto sunscreens. And from sunscreens and um, sustainability and diamonds. I mean, that's that's a, maybe a far stretch, but sunscreen, as you know, uh, comes with different uh, ingredients. And and most people, do you know what kind of ingredients are in, in sunscreen? What do you think? Um. Well, there's something white, so I've almost guessed that that's um, what zinc oxide or uh, titanium dioxide. Yeah, 
Yeah, co correct. That's uh, that's the, the, the most of, of uh, sunscreens have an, um, a mixture of organic and and inorganic matters uh, to block the sun. And in, indeed, the, the white stuff comes from the titanium uh, dioxide mixed with zinc uh, oxide. And um, in the past, it was also a lot of organics like oxobenzene and oxy no, uh, oxides and other uh, more aromatic, bit more irritative chemicals, but they, they are banning uh, that now. But the zinc one is an interesting one. I, I, I'm not a mineralogist, I'm a chemist, so it, it, it was a new world for me, so to speak, where I dove into. And in zinc, uh, sorry, titanium oxide consists of two types uh, of natural uh, mainly mainly uh, occurring uh, minerals is it's, uh, rutil and anatase. And probably if you have um, uh, sapphires or rubies at home, maybe or maybe not, then you can see a little bit of anatase in a ruby gives, gives an, an, uh, a star formation. They, they call it asterism in the ruby. That's caused by the rutil, which is included in the ruby. So I was amazed by that. And that brings also us to Melvin Phenolytical, because of course we can analyze uh, a white powder if it's zinc oxide and titanium uh, oxide with X-ray fluorescence. But the mineralogy difference is there's where you need X-ray diffraction, because this um, uh, titanium dioxide can, these many forms, there are actually 13 different mineral forms of titanium dioxide, depending on what's pressure and timing and cooking they have been in the earth. But the um, uh, the, the uh, rutil is the most natural f f form, and, and that has a very nice um, property, because it, it disperses UV radiation very well. So it's not absorbing or blocking, but it disperses it. While in contrast to the organic part, they absorb the UV radiation and get in an excited state molecule, which can form radicals and go ballistic and create cancer. These kinds of things. But the other one is, uh, so the inorganic ones, is uh, a mineral. And that also uh, links to diamonds, because people think, what, rutile, anastase, titanium, diamonds, and diamonds, where's the link? No, the link is very simple. Um, diamonds are a form of, of carbon. And your graphite in your in your what is it? Uh, your I forgot the English word. Are you right with pencil? Pencil. Sorry. Yeah, I was, I was going to say potload in Dutch, but pencil. Yeah, it's it's also graphite, but it's also a, a, a carbon. But if you uh, press it very hard, you get diamonds. And if you put your diamonds in X-rays, they go back to graphite. So don't put analyze your diamonds with your X-rays because it's another stable state. So that was my thinking of all these kinds of. Uh, uh, particles in uh, sunscreen, and the other one is, these are nano-sized particles. Are they dangerous or not? So they did studies to see if the coral in the ocean, coming back to the sea, was influenced by titanium dioxide particles, be because they can um, disperse the UV light, and maybe that gives some extra uh, uh, detrimental effects on the life on the coral. It did not. So that's the good news. So if you want to have a good sun uh, blocker, use more minerals in it and less chemicals. And also I learned cruelty free sun blockers, cruelty free. So that means there were no animals used in testing these sun blockers. How, was, do, how do they work, um, uh, uh, Tucker? How does a sunscreen work? I, I already gave a little bit away of the clue there. It disperses the UVA and UVB uh, radiation, so that it it becomes not it goes into your skin, but it reflects back in a dispersed way, so it's less harmful and not so uh, not so intense. And um, but it's it's a bit nice or not so nice to put a, a pure mineral on your face. Yeah. And then they they reduce the size, and it's amazing. Uh, uh, below a certain amount of of uh, measure, the the white disappears and it becomes opaque. So, yeah. but then you get micro micro uh, uh, particle sizes, and you have to be careful about the toxicity. So it's an optimum there. That's a very good question. I mean, that's why that, that if you go too small, they then use it as a, almost as a varnish coating. So, so titanium dioxide, if you go no, too small, they use it on laminate flooring to give it a shine rather than as a, pig, a pigment because it's transparent at that size. 
Six, six, so that must then link back to what you were talking about in our last podcast, because you were look at, talking about, and I'll try and get the word right, the expo zone. And I think you told us all how much uh, lipstick we uh, uh, consumed or something like that. I'm still shocked at that. Uh, at, uh, but here, the sunscreens, that's then part of that research, like you say, uh, a titanium dioxide, very active material. It's UV active. It absorbs, it scatters. Um, yeah. It can have an interaction with organic materials. And what does that mean in terms of exposure? So, and Interestingly, I had to go measuring some a couple of about two weeks ago. Uh, the adult sunscreens tend to be water based. But the children's ones, they have to have olive oil as a primary kind of ingredient. So you're almost kind of frying your children by putting olive oil on their skin. But but they were actually oil based. And that's the reason why what the kids do when they're on holiday, go swimming. So okay. that's why it's oil based. So it's to give it more of a kind of a natural layer and stay on more. But I'm, it's I'm glad you say oil based, uh, Steve. I'm, I'm very glad you say oil because don't do use palm oil oil based because that's not sustainable because then it ships with with planes or or ships to here. You should use. Well, I was indeed. looking with with olive oil based, so that should be more yeah. sustainable. Yeah, it's also very healthy. So, I wouldn't eat it though. No, no. <laughs> Use so it as a salad dressing. <laughs> so there you go. We've got um, uh, building your sandcastle. Need to know about particles and elemental composition and the structure of uh, particles. Uh, protecting yourself from the sun while you're doing that. We need to know about particles and dispersion in different media and uh, what type of mineral types we're working with and how that affects their functionality. So um, uh, then it's up to me to close this out because I don't know about you, after I've built a, uh, a really fine sun ca- uh, sandcast and I'm sitting there protected from the UVA and UVB, probably getting a little bit hot, I immediately reach for ice cream. And so that was the, uh, I thought, uh, yeah, that should be the topic for me, sun, sand, the sea and uh, an ice cream. You scream, we scream, you all scream for our ice cream. And uh, of course, one of the most engineered foodstuffs that you can uh, uh, that you can uh, uh, buy, really. It's quite amazing that it exists, uh, possibly a fluke in it in, uh, in Italy when it was first developed in, uh, in, in realizing that you could stabilize such a, uh, a, a, a food product. But really, really um, uh, uh, in its engineering, a link into to, to, to modern panelistical. So um, uh, I, one thing I always tell people, I've got a PhD in ice cream. I did my PhD with Unilever. Uh, looking at what happens when you freeze ice creams. Unfortunately, I didn't get to eat it all, but it's still fun to say that, except for at dinner parties, of course. Nobody wants to talk to me about ice cream. I talk too much. But uh, ice cream, what is it? It's um, a, a, it's a, a product. It contains a, um, uh, uh, it's a colloidal suspension. It contains an emulsion of, of milk fats, so fats in there. You've got the aqueous phase from the milk, but you've also got um, a foam. It contains air bubbles, and that's what makes it light and fluffy and you're interested in engineering something that is is stable over time and feels nice when you eat it so ideally you will need the the ice crystals that form in the ice cream to be uh, under 20 microns in size if they're not then it feels very very uh, 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 gritty and so that's the first area where we get involved in, in looking at how um do we achieve, achieve that particle size in the in, in the ice cream during processing and therefore have a mouthfeel that's nice and smooth and feels luxurious and, and also it doesn't freeze you. If the ice crystals are too large, it can feel very, very cold, the ice cream, whereas if they're finer, then you get less of that cold, freezer, frozen brain effect when you, uh, when you eat it. But there's something else as well. You want to put air into ice cream and naturally, I don't know if you've tried putting air into water, it tends to bubble straight out again. Exactly. And What's really important here is, and this is where the engineering comes in, is that you have to destabilize the milk. So the milk contains all these fat particles and they actually have to become unstable and grouped together in clusters. And those clusters then sit at the interface of the bubbles and protect the bubbles in the ice cream mixture. So it actually becomes an unstable emulsion. And in that instability, it gives you the ability to whip air in. And, and of course, that then gives it its light fluffiness and uh, that becomes the uh, amazing product that we all become addicted to. And that, that science of understanding the degree of stability um, uh, of, the, of the fact uh, you have to allow for 
for things like, you know, differences in what cows are eating during the year affects the stability and the amount of, of fat. If you want to move away from dairy based ice creams to plant based ice creams, you then have to work out, well, how am I going to create an, 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 an emulsion that is creamy, but also still stabilizes the uh, the air in the in the foam and, and, and things like that. If I want to up the amount of protein, so new products now, you can get health ice creams that give you a blast of protein for after after you've done all those exercises to make sure your wrist is working okay after your accident taco, then uh, you can have a protein ice cream to boost wow. your strength. But of course, if you put more protein in, what does that then do to the stability of the fat? How does that affect uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, the way you then process it? So, uh, um, so Paul, yes, Paul, fantastic story. And, and you you strike a couple of chords here on sustainability with uh, plant based uh, fat uh, yeah. ice creams. And is that a big difference? These fats from plants to animals? I would expect so. Uh, yes, and and also. Uh, um, uh, in the past, added addition of other oils like palm oil may have been a way to reduce the cost of ice cream, and that's not sustainable. So then you need to look at other sources of oils and what the effect that that has on the taste, but also the the microstructure and the and the makeup because you're balancing the the protein and the other surface active materials that are present, like monoglycerides, for instance, uh, in the oil yep. phase. How does that then affect the uh, uh, the stability and the particle size of the fat? And then polymers as well. You're adding uh, all sorts of gums and stabilizers into the liquid, and that affects the way the ice crystals grow, and can, uh, along with processing, has an effect on the mouthfeel as well. Wow. One of our US customers is a company called Brave Robot, okay. and they make uh, cows free cows milk ice cream. And it, of course, okay. across the US, I've yet to to discover it to eat eat here outside. Oh, I've been to the US since it's been launched, but I will have a look for it next time I'm there. So do you know why we like ice cream so much? It, it, there's actually some science behind this, and it's something called the bliss point. Have you heard of the bliss point before? Oh. It's, a, it's a composition of the, the perfect amount of sugar, salt, and fat in a, a, in a product that will trick our brains into believing that a food product is the most nutritious it could be. And there is a certain way of mixing out. So if you take a blob of fat and you eat it, you go, <laughs> if you take too much sugar, you eat it, you go, oh, too sweet. Um, if you took too much salt, it's like that. Eh. But there's a way of mixing it all. And there was research done in the 1950s to find, uh, uh, find what's called the bliss point, which is the perfect mixture of them that turns on all our senses and wants us to eat more. And it just happens that um, uh, cream and ice cream, are, uh, well, ice cream in particular, are right on top of that bliss point. So that's um, uh, in its composition. It really is one of those things that... When we eat it, we want to keep eating eating more. So it's um, some uh, it triggers our brains in a way and makes us feel very very happy. So uh, there is a weird also, make that, that jump, and I think also Steve is involved there. So I, I started my career in Heineken, and we were investigating the stability of bubbles from yep. beer, mm -hmm. and that is coming close to ice. And what we found, we did an experiment with uh, argon gas. Uh, instead of CO2 in the beer, and it, you couldn't get it dead. The, the, the foam was there the next day even. So I was wondering if you put argon in ice, will that have a different mouth feeling? Yep, yep. Uh, and and also different stability, and uh, that's something you have to allow for in ice creams. A lot of ice creams will come with cut. For instance, there's one in the UK called Magnum, which has a chocolate coating. And you know, right. depending on uh, uh, how the ice cream expands and contracts during uh, 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 during processing and and uh, and transport, uh, and you don't want to crack the chocolate. And you then have to consider, well, uh, you know, one of the ways that people are considered is. Could I change the gas that I, uh, yeah. I I whip into the the chocolate? Actually, in that case, I think they develop porous chocolate, but chocolate's a different topic. So, do you want to know my favourite ice cream? Do you want to know my favourite ice cream? Yeah, what is it? What is it? It, 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 is, a, it is a product called Vianetta, and I and I like I, Vianetta. Yeah, in the I UK. like it. I know it. I know it. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Very, it's considered it was when it was launched. It was considered very posh, and this is a multi-layered um, uh, uh, ice cream that has layers of ice cream, then sprayed chocolate, and then another layer of ice cream. And it's an extruded product. 
and it was the first of its kind. In fact, you could almost say it's the first, one of the first 3D printed um, uh, 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 ice creams, and then it's a constantly printing the wiggles in a in a, in a Vionetta. And in order to do that, it required an uh, engineering of the ice crystal size and the uh, and, and the polymer makeup in order for it to be pumpable but then to freeze in the shape once you uh, once wow. it's been extruded or, or printed and there's That's another amazing. story about that then just to prove how that bliss point is important in indonesia the makers of uh, vionetta they withdrew the product from the market in the early 2000s and 75,000 people in indonesia signed a, a petition for the manufacturer to bring it back into the market in 2020 and so it was reintroduced to the uh, indonesian market so uh, an amazing product really nice to eat and proves we've all screened for ice cream so there you go and there's lots of weird, weird, weird urban myths because contrary to what people think margaret thatcher did not invent the soft served ice cream there you go but Ooh. that's one of the things apparently when she when she died it was her obituary some of the u.s press had credited her because it was, it was in her career she worked for a company that was involved but there's no direct evidence that she invented soft served ice cream wow from I also sand. heard all the, all the different, totally different subject that um, some people turned modern milk into ice cream. Yeah. So and and that might be also very healthy for 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 young babies, of course, but also maybe for for other people. So maybe Vianetta modern milk, maybe that's. I good. I I, did, I have measured that in the last month. Oh, I, I have actually measured the particle size of breast milk in the last month. My goodness, come on, from sand to sunscreen to ice cream to Margaret Thatcher to and breast to milk. breast milk. What else do you want from a podcast? I know. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tucker. Thank you very much, Steve. And another excellent uh, uh, discussion. I've enjoyed it. Hope you guys have too. Yep. Are we up for number four? I think so. All yes. right. Then. Well, everyone, we hope you've enjoyed this. And I hope that you've enjoyed listening to us um, uh, wibble away about the wonders of material science and where we see it in our everyday. And we'll welcome you back to Podcast 4 in the near future. Thank you all. Have a lovely summer. Right. Bye bye.